أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني أفقه قولي السلام عليكم everybody wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah this is our final lecture for the series inshallah for this rsr series and inshallah the information that has been shared has come of use and benefit and that we can all and speaking to ourselves first be able to take this knowledge and try to apply it in our daily life inshallah and to commemorate such an occasion, let us give the thawab of this session to our Sahib al Asr with Zaman through the recitation of Taha and Faraj, inshallah. Awud billahi min ash shaytan al rajim, bismillah al rahman al rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Allahumma kun li waliyka al hajjat min al hasan. Salawatik alayhi wa ala abai. في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسنه أرضك طوعا وتوجع فيها طويلا برحمتك يا رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد So so far in our series we've looked at the four souls inside of us and these are the planted soul the animalistic soul the divine intellectual soul and inshallah the focus of today's lecture the divine universal soul and what we spoke about most importantly is that we require all of these souls because together we are able to not only survive in this world but strive for our eternal life in the akhirah inshallah and so it, it's really important to recognize that these souls are in a hierarchy or that we require one to be able to actualize the next so at our current state we have two actualizing souls but once upon a time these were to actualize these souls were also in potential so remember when we talked about the plantic and the animalistic soul and their origins, we said that the plantic soul's origin is as soon as you are conceived, meaning before your conception, this soul is in potential. Your animalistic soul comes to you around four months in the womb when you start to uh, gain senses. And before then, you only had the plantic soul. And this plantic soul aided you in actualizing your human soul. How? Because it continued to replicate your cells so that you can form organs which can help you establish senses like skin, like eyes, like ears, like a nose, like a mouth. Although you weren't using them in the same sense that we use them today, you were still using them to be able to comprehend the womb or where you were and then we spoke about how we can use attributes of our animalistic soul to help us in actualizing our human soul and that the fact that we need to gain this control over our animalistic soul is the strive and purpose of our of our universal soul once it is actualized and so this comes to our final point which is we cannot strive to achieve the actualization of our universal soul without having first actualized our divine intellectual soul. So we need to work on the previous four steps that we discussed. Loving Allah, loving our Ahlul Bayt, dhikr and hanging out with the right people so that we can achieve this first step before we even come close to touching the soul because it is the most profound of these souls as we will see inshallah. The main purpose of the soul, the divine universal soul, is that it can get us to the neighborhood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Sadhana. And this can only be achieved when somebody does not recognize themselves as an individual anymore. They recognize themselves as a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a very big difference between a servant and a slave. And Imam Ali describes this very, very well. Imam Ali alayhi salam says that a person who strives uh, to um, for the Jannah is a merchant. Why are they a merchant? Because what they're doing is they're making deals with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will pray and in return you will give us hasanat so that we can go to Jannah. This person is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because although they are doing um, good in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what they're striving for is a reward and not the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A great example of this is, for example, a baron and a, a servant. So a baron, he has a large piece of land and a lot of serfs work for him. They would do the farming and that kind of thing. And one day he was super, super busy, but he needed a coat. And so what he did is he asked one of his serfs to come and he gave them some money so that he can go and buy the coat. In return, he would get his freedom. So what the serf is now to the baron is a servant and not a slave because they're getting something out of the transaction. Whereas the slave would just be happy to do the orders of the baron without requiring or seeking a reward. So inshallah, the people who are in the neighborhood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And examples of these slaves are our prophets and our imams. And how can we see this? Well, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a perfect system. And this system requires many, many slaves doing the bidding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These include the angels, these include the winds, the seas, the mountains. And if we go back to the lecture of loving Ahlul Bayt, when we talked about the universal role of our prophets in Ahlul Bayt, we said that they were part of the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we become his slaves, we become part of his system. Currently, we're not in that state. And the reason for that is because we use our free will for our own good. We do not use our free will for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the reason why our free will can lead to bad. Whereas the um, prophets and um, Ahlul Bayt are ma'sumin. And the reason why they are ma'sumin is because they do not use their free will for their own good. They only use it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, there is no chance for them to do bad because they recognize their role in the system. And if they simply follow their role in the system, you can never disrupt the system. And so you cannot create anything negative. So inshallah, we want to look at what the soul is, the soul that our um, prophets and our Ahlul Bayt have been able to actualize to reach the state of being a part of the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not something which is able to do whatever they please. So again, we return to the hadith of Imam Ali alayhi salam where he describes the soul. He says, النعيم في الشقاء العز في الذل الفقر في الغنى الصبر في البلاء ولها خاصتان خاصتان الرضا والتسليم وهذه التي مبدؤها من الله وإليه تعود قال الله تعالى فنفخت فيه من روحي وقال تعالى يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجع إلى ربك راضية so the translation for this is that the divine universal soul has five tools existence and annihilation peace of mind and hardship dignity and humiliation poverty and richness and patience and challenges and it has two characteristics contentment and submission 
It is the soul that originates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to him it will return. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, I blew into him from my spirit. And, O oh secure soul, return to your Lord content and satisfied. So, this soul that Imam Ali alayhi salam, is describing is what in fact we call a spirit. It is our spirit. The spinal soul is our spirit. And it only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the thing which makes us everlasting. And to it, it will return to the high, the full height and the full qayyum. So, as we do with these, we will split it up. We'll look at its origin, its characteristics, and its tools all separately. So we start with the origin. Origin of the soul, as we said, it's a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given human beings. It is something that, as described in the Quran, we do not understand. And we should not seek to understand it because we'll never be able to with our limited mind. But what we do know about it is that it is the only thing that completes the circle of life and returns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is the everlasting part of us and we need to take care of it. Now we look at its characteristics. They were contentment and submission. So the first one we need to talk to and talk about is contentment. And here we're using contentment as a translation for rilla. However, as always, there is a difference between the English and the Arabic language. And contentment can be uh, confusing because there are two words which are very similar in Arabic. And the first one is rilla, which is the one that we're talking about. And the second one is qana'a. And there's a very, there is a difference between these two. So someone who has rila of something not only agrees to it, but they are approving or happy with the results and the consequences. They are not opposed to any of the ideas given. However, qana'a, yes, you can be content with something, but you're like, mm, that's not exactly the right thing. That's not how I would have done it. For example, a good example of this is when you're doing a group project, say, and someone has an idea and your entire group really likes this idea and you are going to do this for the project. You can have two responses to this. The first one is Rila, which is you're on board completely with this idea because you're really, you're satisfied by it. And so you're going to put in all your effort. Whereas the second response is that because everybody is doing this and you know you have to work together as a group you're going to do this and you are going to put 100% into the effort however you do not think that this idea is the best idea which has been proposed so in both cases the actions look the same however your state internal state are very different and so what we can say is that rila is a more specific version of Kana'a because it has more requirements to it. It is a more profound version of Kana'a. Uh, and so when we're talking about Srila, what we truly mean is that we are completely rally with the system and the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when it comes to our ulama, they split this into three different stages. They say Rila comes in three stages, and we're going to look at these three stages. The first one is to be content with the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does this actually mean? And they also separate this into three things. The first one is making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's contentment with you the most beloved thing to you. Meaning that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is approving of your actions, meaning your good deeds, you make this the most loved thing to you, which means that you are continuously striving in your life to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. It is not limited to simply a'mal. You're going further and beyond in your actions to 
continuously gain happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards you because you want him to say pay attention to you or you want him to be pleased the second of these stages is making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's contentment with you your priority in life so now you're not only striving to continuously making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy it is your goal in life so what you're striving to do is continuously making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy and so we can give a very simple example of this a husband and a wife what they do to each other is for example they continuously show their love and appreciation to one another the uh, husband comes home with flowers or chocolates um, he comes home with a smile on his face the wife she cleans the house she cooks a lovely dinner she always keeps a smiling face what they are doing in that way is to ensure that the other person is continuously happy and so this is what we're doing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone is in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they continuously want to make him happy. They continuously want to keep him satisfied with them. And so they will keep working and working towards that. And of course, this is something infinite. There's no limit to this. And this is why we see our imams and prophets. They continuously keep asking for more they continuously do more and more they don't just stop at a single point they're continuously trying to improve on themselves because they recognize that this stage is infinite and the last one is making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's contentment with you the most worthy thing to obey so now not only is it your goal in life you've made it as something that he has asked you to do so it's kind of like you reading between the lines and you're like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants this from us. And so now it does not only becomes something, a goal in life, it becomes the purpose of life and the best of all purposes, inshallah. And that's all stage one. <laughs> so we can see how incredible our imams and, uh, our imams and, and um, prophets were because they were at this stage or beyond the stage in fact i don't believe they were at stage one so what is stage two stage two is being content with the judgment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his entire system and this is also split into three different stages the first one is your state does not change despite any form of hardship so what that means is that if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a test in life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test his mu'mineen and his servants and slaves, inshallah. And what we need to ensure, or if we want to reach this stage of rilla, is that we do not feel um, unloved or sad or angry at any of the challenges that come towards us. We keep the same internal state that we have before the challenge and keep that towards throughout the entire challenge and come out with it at the end and it is the state of inner peace and happiness the second of these two stages is that you do not make any creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your opponent so this means that we do not judge somebody but not only that it means we do not select enemies. If there is someone that we disagree with, we do not consider them as an enemy, but we consider them as someone who may require more knowledge, who may require more maturity. And so what we need to do is attempt to aid them. So we can look at a very good example of this, which is Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala. He did not give up on the army of Yazid as soon as they reached Karbala. In fact, every before every battle, before the, uh, even the day of Ashura, the Imam would go to the army of Yazid and he would tell them, this is what you're do doing. You have a chance now to turn back. He 
who's always trying to help them to avoid the bad deed that they may commit in the future. And of course, this worked with many of them. And we have a great example who is Herb, the leader of the um, opposition, who converted and was one of the Ansar of Imam Hussein and who was martyred on the field next to his Imam. It's an incredible change, and this would have only occurred if the Imam had done what he'd done. And this is where it comes from. The last one of these is being dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. He is our Qayyum. We do not need anybody else to lean on. We do not need the help of anyone else. And see, this is something which is very interesting is that Sada, for example, they can't take Sadaqah, they cannot take helpings from other people. And it's because they are completely dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, at least the Ahlul Bayt were. And inshallah, all of our Sada today are at the same stage as well. We will pray that they all are as well. And then the last and final stage of Rida is to be content with the content of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that we are satisfied with the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? It means that we do not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for more. That we know that what he has given us is a consequence of what we have given him. And that we are in a relationship of love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have reached Qalb al-Salim and that he is the only thing there and what that means we do not strive for any material gain it's this beautiful quote Uridu and na urid it was a dua and so this is the state that we want to reach we want to reach that we don't want anything from ourselves but everything that we want is only the want of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is when someone has completed Rida. And so uh, the um, just no, ulama split this for us to look at how this manifests, manifests itself among the people. And they say, it, um, this person will have good assumptions and thoughts about everything they approach in life. So they always look at the half glass full. They are open-chested, not open-minded. There's a big difference. Open-chested means that they are willing to sympathize and empathize with people and to sit down and listen to them and to be able to absorb and digest the story not to consider new ideas which are outside of Islam. Of course, we are allowed to have an open, we're allowed to let ideas, if we are capable of controlling our paper, we're allowed ideas in. However, we must not let them engrave in ourselves. And that's why it doesn't say open-mindedness, but open-heartedness. The, uh, the third is that you're detached from being closed up from other people or or having any form of envy, which is pretty straightforward. Um, they are unaffected by others, so they have these shields up. They have these primary and secondary hijabs up and any other shields that they wish to put. And finally, they are enthusiastic. Imam Ali alayhi salam has a hadith which says that the people who have qalb al-salim, a, a safeguarded heart, a sign of them is that they are not lazy, but they work all of the time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And someone who does not have a safeguarded heart likes to relax. So we need to really consider where we are um, and to kind of track ourselves and see how we can change this, inshallah. So now we're going to go to the second, um, the second characteristics which is submission. And the ulama also split submission into different different stages. And so the first stage is accepting the things that we do not comprehend. And alhamdulillah, there are parts that we are doing. We do not comprehend in the akhirah. Yet we as Muslims 
believe that in its existence. We accept that it will occur. However, there are many Muslims out there which are doubting the simple, simple fundamental part of Islam because they're being influenced by society. So inshallah, we can get rid of this and truly just accept Islam as a religion. We do not need to understand everything about it. Imam Sadiq says that every word in the Quran has 70 different meanings. So imagine how many different interpretations of the Quran there are. Surely we cannot understand all of that. So we need to accept it. The second of these stages is accepting the experiences that we do not comprehend. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us experiences to push us to continue to strive forward. And a great example of this is Hajj. Um, and so you'll see a lot of people coming back from Hajj and they cannot describe to you what they felt. And the reason for that is because they don't understand what they felt. They felt it though. So some people come to doubt these um, feelings. They're like, oh no, they're just, oh, you know, I was too excited in the moment and that's why I felt this particular thing. No. We need to recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does sometimes give us these things and we may not understand them, like especially our ulama. They get so many premonitions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they do not, they may not understand and we certainly do not understand if they tell us about them. And so what we need to do is to accept them, inshallah. And the final of these stages is accepting that there is no truth but the truth. And this is something which perhaps is the hardest thing to do in today's day and age, where there is this huge emphasis on science, say. There's this huge emphasis on, um, you know, uh, uh, having peer-reviewed papers or information which is from a reliable source. What is a reliable source? Do we truly know? that what a reliable source is, the only reliable source we have is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers. So the only truth we know to be the truth is the truth written in the Quran. So we need to stand by that and accept that there's no truth other than that. We can use other things that we understand from the world like science and history to explain and interpret parts of the Quran because as we said, it, each word has 70 different meanings. And so these meanings are relevant for every stage of humanity. But we cannot say that this is strictly the only meaning of the Quran. We need to be clear that the Quran has multiple layers and that we're not at that stage to understand the layers, so we must simply accept it. And when you reach that, that is when you truly reach Islam. That is when you truly can your, call yourself a Muslim. So, those were the characteristics. Now let's look at the faculties of the soul. And so, existence and annihilation, peace of mind and hardship, dignity and humiliation, poverty and richness, and patience and challenges. And, look, and we need to recognize, um, or this is disclaimer that we want to say, is that we don't understand the soul. So it was very difficult for us to be able to give any form of content about what the soul actually means. However, we know people who have actualized the soul, who are our prophets and our imams. And so what we'll be doing to represent these faculties is showing you from the lives of our um, prophets and imams where this came in, inshallah. So the first one is annihilation, uh, existence and annihilation. So we know that the only high who is ever existing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given humanity the ability to become his representative on earth so we're going to 
simulate this example, but with all our si simulations of a glass of fine tile, we need to recognize that they are far from the truth. But there is a way for our simple minds to com sorry to comprehend complex um, concepts. So what we're going to do is consider a glass of fine tile as this beautiful diamond. However, we know a glass of fine tile is much more beautiful and much more incredible than a diamond, of course. And as the representatives of these diamonds, what we are, are its mirrors. So what we simply do is we reflect the attributes of the diamond. We reflect the beauty of this diamond. However, if this mirror that we are, we decide to decorate with stickers and photos and put fancy writing and quotes on it, what happens? It removes from the beauty and the importance of the diamond because now it is lost. It's lost in this chaos which is the mirror. So this is what it means because what is happening here is that we are trying to assert our own, say, personality on the soul that we are trying to achieve, say, this divine universal soul. We are tainting it with our ego. And when we're tainting it with our ego, the true purpose of that soul, which is to be the representative of Allah and the reflector of his attributes, is lost. And that's what we see a lot, where there are people who do many beautiful things, but they are not recognized as the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but instead people with good attributes or people who have these good traits. So what we need to do to truly exist as our purpose of being the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to remove the ego, to annihilate it, annihilate our sense of self. So that what remains is our true existence as the mirror of this diamond. Get rid of the me and become the slave. And when you become the slave, you exist in the system. And that is the purpose of every creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to be part of the system of life. So that is the first one. The second is peace of mind and hardship. And before we look at it, I want to take a good look at this picture. So this smiley face, it seems very happy. It doesn't know that it's going to be wiped out in a few seconds. Maybe, maybe not. But in either case, it's not letting it determine its mood and the current state. It's not letting it change its internal state and that's what this means having peace of mind and hardship that whatever is thrown at us of tests it does not change how we approach the test how we conduct ourselves in the test and how we come out of the test i mean we see ourselves just a normal test at school say we're really anxious and we have high anxiety before the test. In the actual test, we're writing so frantically and we're frustrated and we're trying to get everything done out of time, in time. And then when we come out, you can either be super relieved that it's over or you can be really, your anxiety is heightened or you feel angry or disappointed with yourself because you answered the question wrong. So your state is changing throughout these. That's not having peace of mind. Having peace of mind meaning that means that your state is completely the same throughout. And a good example of this is Nabi Ayyub Because what happened to Nabi Ayyub was that his riches were taken away from him. His um, livelihood was taken away from him. His children were taken away from him and his body was taken away from him. His health was deteriorating. But that did not stop his attitude. What does he say in Surah Al-Anbiya? Inni masni al-dhar wa anta arham al So when he lost his money, he thought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the most merciful. When he lost his health, he thought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the most merciful. And when he lost his children, he thought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the most merciful. This is peace of mind. 
peace of mind in any state, shape or form that you may be in. The next one is dignity and humiliation. And the best example of this is Yusuf alayhi salam. So we know that uh, Yusuf alayhi, uh, the person that Yusuf alayhi salam was living with in Masr was interested and she was trying to seduce him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the seven do locked doors so Yusuf alayhi salam could escape. However, even in the state in which he was in, which he was now uh, escaped from haram, it didn't stop there. The woman continued to accuse him and they were given an option. He was given an option either to come to, to succumb to her uh, seduction and to follow her orders or to be put in jail. And he picked to be put in jail because he recognized that his dignity as the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more important than his dignity of self among the people. To humiliate himself in front of all of Masr by being tortured and put into prison when he was in a, such a high status was better to him than having to lose that position of being the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an incredible story. And so we remind you again that to do this, we need to kill the ego. Because if we really take in the opinions of the people around us, and we want to make sure that people view us in the most positive of light, which we're not saying is a bad thing, because it comes with many benefits if we want to continue our journey, but it can also come as a hindrance when it starts to conflict with us being the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that everything that we do is for Allah, not for ourselves. So we return to dua makan al-nakhlaq for this. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa la tarfa'ni fi nasi darajatan illa hatattani and nafsi mithliha wa la tahdithni azzan mahiran illa so, O oh God, praise Muhammad and his household and do not lift me in the eyes of man without uh, degrading me in the eyes of myself equally. And do not give me apparent dignity without causing me inner humiliation by the same account. Now we look at the fourth of these five um, tools. And it is poverty in richness. And who better to look at this than the most richest of all our Anbiya, the kings. So the first is Dawood alayhi salam. So Dawood, as we know, started off not very rich. He was a simple shepherd. But then he went on um, the battle with Qalu. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the king that he went with. Inshallah, it will come back to me. And he fought and he defeated Goliath. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave news to the prophet of Bani Israel that Dawood alayhi salam will be your next king. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him this point of great status so that he can achieve his purpose. However, we know that Dawood alayhi salam did not, was not corrupted, say, by this um, power that he had. And in fact, he was continuously going out by himself among the mountains and singing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, singing him for aid, for wisdom, for his assistance, so that he can make the best of decisions and so he does not cause any form of corruption because with power we said comes corruption so he always asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him he said I am the poor who has no judgment so give me this and the mountains used to sing with him a second example of this is Sulaiman alayhi salam Sulaiman was not only rich in terms of wealth and power but he had control over the animals the winds the seas the mountains 
everything would do his bidding. The, even the jinn and the angels would do his bidding. That's how much influence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given Sulaiman alayhi salam. However, he did not use this as a way to get back at anything. In fact, he respected everything that he had. And he reduced himself in the eyes of everybody around him because he recognized that it was the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted his um, part of the prophet, uh, his role of the prophecy to be, is to show how to be a rightful ruler. And finally, we go to the last one, patience and hardship. And we do not need to look further than Karbala to see this. Zainab alayhi salam, when, uh, patience and challenges. So Zainab alayhi salam went through a very difficult challenge in Karbala. Her entire family was slaughtered in front of her and Islam was being, um, the true form of Islam was being hacked in her eye, in front of her eyes. But she recognized that with all the sadness, this comes with a great, great reason because she knows the importance of Karbala in the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what she says, Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. All I have seen is beauty because she's recognized that this is necessary to occur so that Imam al Mahdi can bring back the true Islam. And to her, that is more beautiful than to have her children by her side. It is more beautiful than to have her brother with her. Another example of this is Nuh alayhi salam. So the wife and the um, uh, oldest son of Nuh alayhi salam did not believe in him and they were taken by the flood. Of course, this would have caused any person, including Nuh alayhi salam, great grief. However, he recognized the importance of what must occur because badness needed to be eradicated and so he accepted what was going to occur and we see this clearly demonstrated in the Quran. So the thing that we wanted to also point out is what is the difference between patience and challenges and peace of mind in hardship? And the difference is the state the person is in. We need to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not expect from us to be always happy because we are allowed to show emotions such as sadness. See, look at our Prophet when he sees the munafiqeen among his ummah, the kafirin, it fills him with a lot of sadness. And the same applies to Zainab and Nuh They were sad because of all the badness they saw around them, that these people were killing their potential in front of their eyes. Whereas with Ayyub he didn't see someone who was killing their potential in front of their eyes. He was the one being tested. In these cases, they were uh, in the case of Nuh and Zainab they were seeing people failing their tests. And that caused them distress. Why? Because they were open-chested, open-hearted. And so they felt that. They felt it within themselves of what was occurring to the person in front of them. So this is a short and a short summary of the divine universal soul and it's the only summary that we can give at this stage because we are not there to understand it yet in its fullest form. So where are we? What, where are we in terms of our journey towards Kamal? And to be able to understand this, we need to test ourselves first. We need to check where we are because there's no point of us starting from scratch we have a plantic soul we have an animalistic soul so what stage of our actualization of the human soul are we at so that we can continue to move forward from that and the first thing that we can do to test this is by looking at what we define as good and bad so i'll give you a few examples of things that people may perhaps can consider as good one is their status another is their influence on social media, another is Jannah or heaven, and another is family. 
So look at yourself. Which of these do you consider as good? Which ones do you not care about? Which ones do you consider as bad? I'll give you some other examples of things that people may consider bad. Anger or disappointment, homework, <laughs> and family. Some people do consider family as bad, especially these new um, um, environmentalists who think that oh, we're reaching overpopulation, so we need to stop people from being born to save the environment or whatever. So some people do consider family as a bad thing. But the thing is, we need to see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers as good. Time with him, humbleness, humiliation, um, being of service to others and being the one that others depend on, being chivalrous and mujahideen in the sake of the truth. How much of these do our values align with? And so by checking this, we can recognize where we are, which stage we are at. And the same applies to what we consider as bad. Do we consider wasting time as bad? And I mean, of course, many of us will say yes, but we're talking about actions which waste time, say um, excessive uh, playing of games and sports, excessive uh, watching TV, reading fiction novels. Um, there's many things that people uh, which are uh, a waste of time, but people enjoy them and they continue to do them. Of course, as Imam um, Kalamani Salam said, we do have a right to reserve a, a time of our day for our hobbies, but we need to ensure that these hobbies are not wasting this time that we're actually benefiting from it. And of course, the muharramat and the non-muharramat badnesses of this world. Because if we do reach the stage of being able to recognize what we know as good as bad, we can fine tune them. And when we fine tune them, we can start to see the reality of badness and goodness through its consequences. So an example that we always give is, for example, a bar. Some people may think that a bar is a good place to be, inshallah, none of us do. But when we see a bar, what do we see? Just a place with a lot of alcohol. But if we see, you look at what the Mbiya and the Ibn used to see, they used to see fire. So every time you walk up past any alcohol, just feel the burning, the heat, the flames coming towards you. Because that is the reality of what a, that is. And so we need to be avoiding this completely. And this also reflects with many other um, muhannamat that we have. So things to take away. There's these questions that we would like you now to pause the video. All right, after we list these questions and we want you to write down your answers to these questions because inshallah once you have this you'll be able to understand what your next step is which step of actualization you're at and what you need to do so your questions are what do we value in life what do you value in life what are the things that are most important to you what do you prioritize daily? So when you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing you do? During your day, what are the things that you look forward to or you force yourself to do because you believe that they are important? Why are you prioritizing these things? So look at your intention and uh, ultimate goal that you're looking at by doing these actions. So what are your goals for the next 10 years? So plan ahead. Look at what, what do you picture for yourself in the next 10 years? What are the things that you would like to achieve? Because the thing is, we don't know whether or not we have that 10 years. So we need to be able to have a plan set out so that we can keep working at it and not procrastinate it because we don't know when the end will come. So 10 years, yes, it's a very far stretch but it's not very far. It's actually a very short amount of time. And is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our life? 
Do we always think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we see him in the things around us? And finally, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our plan? So now that you've made this plan for the next 10 years, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in there anywhere? If not, we need to reconsider our plan, inshallah. Because the thing is, we don't know when death will come. But when death will come, the questions that Malaika will ask us, the angels will ask us, in our grave, we need to have adequate answers for. These questions will be, what did you use your youth for? So you guys are all young now. Use this time because you're going to be asked about this time. Make sure you're not wasting it. The next one is, what did you finish your life with? So what do you have to present? What is this form that you have created that you now have to live in for the rest of your life? Where, you, where did you get your money from? And where did you spend it? And here, when we mean money, yes, it means this money, but it also means any form of currency you have. And nowadays, currency is not only just um, in terms of gold or um, dollars. It can come in the form of knowledge. It can come for in the form of trade, of goods. It can come as skills and experiences. So where did you get these from? Was it from a source of haram or not? Um, and what did you use it for? Do you have a skill that you're wasting? Or are you using it for the right purposes? And the last one, did you love the Ahlul Bayt? So make sure that you really focus on that step of actualization. Um, and yeah, that's the end of our series, inshallah, RSR 2020. So just a note that the quiz for this week um, will be open until Eid. All the quizzes are open until Eid. Once uh, the last day, last night of Ramadan ends, we will be closing the competition aspect and inshallah, uh, we will be contacting the winners and try to form um, a way to get your prizes to you, inshallah. So if you are still interested in the competition aspect of this, please do try and fill in all your quizzes um, before that time. But if you are not, we hope that, we apologize, first of all, for our um, miss coming and uh, shortcomings in this lecture series and inshallah you've benefited from the small um, amount of information that we've been able to share with you all um, inshallah and sallu ala muhammad wa ala muhammad muhammad wa ala so today's clip is more relevant to the second half of the lecture which is about how we should be striving towards, you know, this state of Kamal, which is an ever continuing state. There's no end to it, as we've seen, like the Imams and the Prophets, they're still strive, they've strove for higher and higher states of Kamal in their entire lives um, because it's infinite. Um, and what we should be doing and perhaps what the consequences of what we're doing now look like. So this clip is from Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. And it's a scene where one of the, the characters aren't very important here, but um, there's a ship called the Black Pearl and it has a curse on it. And this curse means that the people, the crew of the ship are not alive and they're not dead. They're somewhere in between which means that they are pretty much the walking dead. They continuously try to feed their desires, but it's empty. They cannot fulfill their desires. So we'll look at this and how, what exposes them and how one of the characters who comes to the crew, who's not part of the crew, actually reacts to this. <laughs>
Moses. When the night among the elements cannot hide, the night of the dead. For too long I've been punched of thirst and unable to quench it. Too long I've been starved unto death and haven't died. I feel nothing but the wind on my face nor the spray of the sea. Start reading the new ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one. summarizes everything in our lectures. Um, so someone who follows their animalistic soul and continuously strives behind their ego and trying to fulfill their desires, what they do is they're increasing the size of their ego. And so the desires never stop. They continue to grow and grow and grow and they'll never be able to satisfy them. And that's what is happening to the crew. They are pretty much and following their animalistic soul. And so what the form of someone who does that looks like in the hereafter is someone who is dead because they have never tried in their life to become alive, to actualize their humanity. And that's why they take that form. However, our prophets and imams have achieved this. They've achieved the state of mutu qabla and tamutu where they know how their form in the hereafter will look. And so they recognize the reality of all the actions of people. And this is what they see when they look at someone. They see their form in the hereafter. They may see someone as an animal or someone who looks dead or something, someone who's a horrific creature. That must be really, really scary. Like, imagine Imam Sahab al-Asr al-Zaman at this stage where he's now looking at all of us everybody in this world, what is he seeing? What horror is he seeing? And the thing which revealed them, he said, was the moonlight. So only light or the truth can reveal the consequence of one's action and hence the form that they will have in the afterlife. So the two things that we can take from here is we need to control our animalistic soul so that our egos and desires do not grow and so that we do not become dead people but people who are very much alive and so that we need to strive toward um, actualizing our human soul and as part of doing that we will sorry gain the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by gaining the knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will shed light to us and we will start to see the realities of the things around us so inshallah you will be you'll be able to apply this in our and we can apply this in our life um and pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our form is still pure that when the imam is looking at us he does not see the horrific deeds that we have done we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this night of Ramadan to forgive us our bad deeds and to give us the strength and the determination so that we can strive towards our ultimate goal which is to reach Kamal. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.